Just 10 years ago, FC Barcelona represented the golden standard within football. Success on the pitch that was rooted within a club philosophy that focused on the development of young players. Players who were now not only at the top of the world in club football, but in international football as well. But when considering all facets of the club today, the product on the pitch, the state of their academy, the state of their board and finances, this FC Barcelona is far from the Barcelona we watched 10 years ago. How did they get to this point? Let's consider some potential reasons and I'll add my take in there now and then. To start, I personally fall into the camp that Ernesto Valverde was held onto for far too long at Barcelona. The board failed to make any sort of decisions regarding his future, as perhaps Valverde's consecutive league titles, as well as a cup double in his first season at the club, helped to paper over the cracks of doubt in his ability as a manager, not to mention Real Madrid having a poor season where they went through three managers. That, plus Messi's penchant of single-handedly winning matches for Barcelona far too often. First there was the shock loss slash collapse against Roma in 2018 on Valverde's watch. Fine, these things happen, these things in fact are the reasons why we watch football and sport in general that hope that we will witness miracles such as that. But Valverde then oversaw the collapse versus Liverpool in 2019, and then the Copa del Rey final loss to a Valencia side that were showing some signs of instability towards the tail end of the season. Sacking Valverde after the Liverpool collapse would have been understandable to all in the football community, given that Barcelona are a team that strives for European success. Domestic titles aren't necessarily an afterthought, but an expectation. But following the Valencia loss? That would have felt like a natural, understandable point in which they could part ways. And we'll speak more about the habit of collapsing in matches when the going gets tough, later in the video. With Valverde still at the helm, we witnessed a bit of stagnation at Barcelona, the fault of which, while it can be partly down to Valverde, can mostly be pinned on the Barcelona board. All roads lead to the Barcelona board, so stick with me because we'll touch on them in greater detail as well. A mid-season sacking usually doesn't guarantee positive change. Sometimes it can produce unbelievable results, like Zidane at Real Madrid. But in having that sort of expectation, you're expecting the exception to the rule, when the rule is the most likely outcome. That most likely outcome being some sort of stability in order to coast towards the end of the season. While Setien's points per game this season has actually been higher than that of Ernesto Valverde's, Talk FCB did a great comparison between the two that I shall link below. His uninspired tactics and approach will have fans worried. And if that doesn't have them worried, images from Barcelona's recent draw with Celta Vigo might. Of course, the reaction to Messi ignoring and waving away Setien's assistant Eder Sarabia while Setien scratches his head in the background could be overblown. There would be nothing new in that being overblown, but if there is indeed that big of a disconnect, the players do not respect the advice of the coaching staff and they are incapable of motivating the team, well, that's a much bigger problem, and the optics of it really are damning for Setien. Setien's Barcelona has moments within matches where you think, huh, maybe this guy could really find that vintage Barcelona. But unfortunately, there are also moments where the team looks confused as to what they should be doing, moments when they look like they're just hanging on to results as opposed to burying teams, as they did against Celta Vigo, and recently, that has cost them. Again, against Atletico Madrid, they looked lifeless by Barcelona's own standards. That's not to say they weren't exerting energy, but they were having difficulties breaking down Atletico's defense, scoring via an own goal and a penalty, and overall looking slow. Kike Setien can't make his attack of Messi, Suarez, and Vidal from that match any younger, and it's not his fault that the Barcelona squad has been allowed to age so much, but he could play younger players. Not to mention an Antoine Griezmann that was on the bench for the full 90 minutes. Warning, this next idea is a bit speculative, but in following the patterns of Barcelona, it does have me a bit worried. The actions of the board, of course, directly affect the squad, and at Barcelona, we could be seeing the emergence of an issue that has plagued other clubs before. The players start to run the club through making or breaking the coach by playing for themselves and not playing for the coach. Players know that they are in a place of power because it's always easier to fire one man, being the coach, than it is to fire the entire squad. 
Performances can dip as a result of that, as players just continue to go through the motions without the conviction they would have under a manager they respect, a manager that motivates them. And when you're playing at a club that pays some of the highest wages in world football, it's worth hanging around until a new coach arrives. When players realize the power that they have and how they can affect who is coaching them, a vicious cycle can develop. Now, funnily enough, it has taken club legends to be appointed at both Chelsea and United to calm things down there, in Lampard and Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, and they broke the cycle via recruiting younger talents. And when you look at the two most successful coaches at Barcelona in the last decade or so, they're also former players. So, Xavi to the rescue? <laughs> But seriously, he may just be the man they need in order to prevent this sort of thing from happening at Barcelona. They may not be at this point yet, but there's certainly a danger of it happening. But moving beyond the notion of player power potentially becoming a problem at Barcelona in the future, let's look at something that's not a potential problem for the future, but a problem in the present. The mentality of the squad has been shaken, and they've lacked some fight in recent seasons. At PSG, players spoke of how the infamous remontada they suffered at the hands of Barcelona had a lasting impact on them in the coming seasons, and how could it not? Once you're on the wrong end of a comeback of that magnitude, once you blow that kind of lead, the fear of history repeating itself will always be at the back of your mind when you feel control slipping through your fingers in a match. And so, once Barcelona suffered that remontada against AS Roma in 2018, blowing a three-goal lead to lose 3-0 away, that left an open wound in their mentality when they faced Liverpool in 2019. And then, when they hit some hardships early against Valencia in the Copa del Rey final, we saw that weak mentality rear its ugly head once again. I'm of course no psychologist, and I only have some anecdotal evidence from playing myself, but that's a habit that is hard to break out of. That bit of doubt that creeps into your head after every goal you concede throws you off your game completely and requires real leaders to stand up and drag the team out of that mess. To get the players to stop subconsciously accepting that it will happen again, thinking about what the media and the fans will say, and to fight to get back into the match. Sure, you could pin that on one of the on-field leaders such as Suarez, Messi, uh, Vidal or Pique or someone like that, and perhaps they do have some blood on their hands in that regard, but leadership should come from the coach as well. If Roma could beat them 3-0 in Italy, then a much stronger team in Liverpool could surely replicate that at Anfield, one of the toughest places to win for any club, especially on a European night, and they should have worked on the mental aspect prior to it. Hard times against Valencia? We could link this to a bit of fractured resolve within the squad, or it could have just been one of those nights where the less fancied team gets a great result. But when comparing the squads on paper and pedigree, Barcelona should be winning that match, and they should have had a contingency plan in place if things were to slip out of control. Now, if a team can score against them early in that situation, then they will be shaken and likely won't find themselves again in the 90 minutes. But anyways, the makeup of the squad is far from what it used to be both in regards to the talent it used to boast, as well as the source of the talent they used to boast. For quite some time, La Masia was the gold standard as far as football academies go, as their graduates made up the spine of one of the most dominant national teams international football has seen for some time. With La Masia players such as Xavi, Busquets, Puyol, Pique, Iniesta, Pedro and Fabregas, Spain won Euro 2008, then the 2010 World Cup, and then Euro 2012. Without surprising you at all, that also meant that Barcelona was one of the most dominant sides in club football, and with a tactician such as Pep Guardiola at the helm, a man that demands respect, and a man who went through La Masia himself, this team was unbelievable to watch. But as the years have gone on, the amount of La Masia graduates that actually make it into the first team has fallen off in a big way, and those that establish a place within the starting lineup nearly non-existent. This thing that was such a defining aspect of the club, a hallmark of them and their culture, has led to Barcelona losing a bit of their identity and in turn has shifted their eye towards buying their lineup. As far as squad composition goes, what you had before was a team of Barcelona graduates that all had a like-minded approach as far as playstyle and mentality, with youthful exuberance and skill being guided by the leaders who had walked in those footsteps before them, and had been very successful in doing so. That squad composition would be complemented further with players that were sourced from other clubs, but 
Now that ratio has been flipped on its head. Now you have a team of players who may not understand the Barcelona way. And you could argue also managers that don't understand the Barcelona way, both as far as mentality and style. Going beyond that, the squad composition has aged greatly. Looking at Barcelona's 2-2 draw with Celta Vigo, you have two La Masia graduates and Ricky Puig and Ansu Fati, aged 20 and 17 respectively in the starting lineup. But aside from that, the majority of the lineup was over 30 years old. Messi, he's 33. Suarez, 33. Vidal, 33. Rakitic, 32. Jordi Alba, 31. Pique, 33. It's no wonder they look flat and low on energy far too often, especially when so many matches are being played so close together, praying for a messy miracle to drag them over the line time and time again. On top of that, Sergio Busquets, another regular, is 31, rounding out an aging core of Barcelona players. And when you consider the recent move to send 23-year-old Arthur Mello to Juventus, and in turn bringing in 30-year-old Miralem Pjanic, well, that calls into question the actions of the board even more. In fact, under this board's watch, and as alluded to earlier, Barcelona have increasingly grown further and further from their identity. The identity that helped them at one time become the pinnacle of football. Success rooted within a club philosophy of developing talent from within their own ranks, with a distinct ideology surrounding football. Success, of course, not defined by being competitive within their league, but winning multiple league titles and domestic cups consecutively, with some Champions League titles sprinkled in there to boot. A level of success only attained by an elite group of clubs across Europe. Recently, they have moved towards sourcing their squad from outside of the club and allowing many of their academy graduates to move away for nominal fees, many of them leaving for free after never being given a legitimate chance within the first team setup. Prior to their match against Atletico Madrid on June 30th, Ansu Fati has been the outlier of the season in regards to minutes played amongst academy graduates, with 831 in La Liga from 19 appearances. After that, Carlos Perez, now on loan at Roma, ranks the highest with half of the minutes that Fati has accumulated. Carlos Elena, also sent out on loan after playing for just 171 minutes across four appearances. Instead, players over the age of 30 are prioritized in the midfield and across the team in general. Beyond the established players such as Pique, Messi, Busquets, and Sergi Roberto, La Masia Academy graduates have barely made a dent as far as the share of La Liga minutes that are up for grabs, at least thus far. And thus, season after season, they're going elsewhere to get playing time. Is it just a case of a bad batch of talent or poor management of the academy? Football has proven to us time and time again that youth development is, at its base, overly simplistic level, an equation that works out to, you get what you put in. Teams who have focused on developing youth and have invested in it, such as Benfica, Sporting, Southampton, Ajax, and Barcelona in the past, to name a few, have seen the fruits of their labors laid to bear. So, with that basic, overly simplistic rule in mind, let's take a look at La Masia. Part of the reason as to why La Masia has taken a hit was Barcelona's transfer ban from 2015, which they incurred due to breaking FIFA rules with regards to signing minors from abroad. Though that doesn't explain why they have also fallen off in regards to developing local Spanish talent. Barcelona managers have been reluctant to bleed new La Masia talent in for a while now, dating back to Luis Enrique's time with the club. Part of this is due to Bartomeu's mismanagement of La Masia as he launched his Masia 360 strategy, which in short caused internal conflicts within the coaching of the academy, provided nutrition that is substandard for young athletes, diminished the education of the players with regards to the club history and values, shifted the coaching within the academy from the Barca DNA, which had been so successful, to data analysis and the prevention of risk situations. I mean, there's an article in Spanish by journalist Xavi Torres, linked below, going very in-depth as to how Bartomeu's Masia 360 program has in effect killed La Masia when looking at their current state, and cut off not only an aspect that made them unique and propelled much of their success, but a massive point of pride for Barcelona supporters. To me, it seems like it's a bit of a chicken and the egg situation. The talent may be worse, but is that talent only worse because of the mismanagement of the academy? 
And speaking of mismanagement, let's talk about the other massive misstep by this current Barcelona board, their transfer market dealings. In 2013, we saw the arrival of Neymar, a massive signing for the club. And just one year later, in the summer of 2014, Barcelona shored up their attack, midfield, and defense with the signings of Luis Suarez, Ivan Rakitic, and Marc-Andre Ter Stegen, players who had longevity within the club. Since then, however, their transfer dealings have done more to hurt the club's finances and put them in a very precarious position in that regard than to help their position within the European football pyramid and on the pitch. As Dermot Corrigan wrote for The Athletic, since Barcelona's 2014 summer window, Barca have spent more than 800 million euros on new players without even one of them establishing themselves as a senior team leader. Multiple trophy winners Andres Iniesta, Xavi, Dani Alves, and Javier Mascherano are among those to have left without being properly replaced, while a carousel of substandard players have come and gone without making any real impression. So as you can see, their transfers have not only failed to pan out for quite a few seasons now, as Corrigan noted, but they have also managed to cripple the club financially and force them into baffling moves such as the sale of Arthur Mello to Juventus, a promising 23-year-old with the subsequent purchase of Miralem Pjanic from Juventus. Sure, Barcelona net a profit of around 10 million, I think, after all transfer fees, yet Pjanic's wages are about 2 million higher annually than Arthur's were. On top of that, you could argue that Arthur's ceiling is higher just on a basis of a difference of seven years in age. From glimpses of Xavi, as Messi said about Arthur, to a plane ticket to Turin, without even given a real opportunity this season. Pjanic's transfer, while he has his merits and has impressed me in the past, could unfortunately be seen as an encapsulation of the way that Barcelona has been run lately, swapping a younger, promising player for an aging one that will in fact cost them more on a wage basis and adds even more years to an aging squad. Play Pjanic alongside Vidal and Busquets, and they have a combined age of 95 in the Barcelona midfield. Couple that with the current administration allowing La Masia to fall into relative disrepair in comparison to what it once was, the threat of a new manager every few seasons, and a fractured resolve when the going gets tough in big games, and you have the current state of Barcelona. The possibility of them heading in a similar trajectory to that of AC Milan post-2011 seems like it could be a few missteps away if things continue to transpire as they are, and if those messy miracles become less and less frequent. Thanks for taking the time to watch this video and be sure to leave your opinion in the comment section. Where do you think Barcelona have gone wrong? I'm Adrian, this is Rabona TV, and I'll hopefully see you in the next video. Ciao.